So let me invite you to stand and get it to just a blessing. Uh, when we get a symbol and worship in the spirit and the truth, we're going to sit in the base of the presence of the Lord. The spirit leads us to sit. Oh uh-huh. 
rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, Lord, we just thank you, God, for this opportunity to gather this morning. Father, we just, we are here to just lift you up and celebrate you. Be with those who are not able. And God, we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, let me see you. Just glad you're all here. We got your family coming back. It's so good to be back. Amen. Amen. Uh, my goodness, we're, we're excited we're here as well. This is the first time I've been at Chapel Hill. We say a special welcome to you. We've got some information on the stream. Love to record your visit with us today at Chapel Hill. So if you never give us your information, we'd love to text your name, email address, or phone number. And that way we can record your visit. We can record it here at the church. And at the end of the service, come online and go out to the welcome desk and way out. If you've never seen one of our little gifts we've got, we'd love to get that to you. We've got a nice Chapter will be like a visitor welcome this morning. Good morning, Chapel Hill. Um, I was asked to come on and just give an update on the finance committee and where we are. Uh, but first, I'd like to just uh, praise the Lord for being back in uh, God's house again in the church family. Um, I heard it last week, and I'm sure we'll hear it for six months going forward. But it's, um, you know, I thought about it.
Hey, you can give Mark and Greg a hand. Thank you, Bill, for their leadership. These guys have been great during all this uh, pandemic uh, stuff, uh, and uh, they have a great desire to uh, to lead us in worship, and they've done a fantastic job uh, in the middle of all this. Uh, I'm also thankful for Richard and the people that serve on the Lennox Committee. Um, I don't know if you realize this or not, but this place doesn't run by itself. Uh, it takes, now Christ is still the head of the church, right? Uh, but Christ has given each of us a part of, or members of the body. God has put the right people in the right place at the right time. And uh, how good it is to have people like we have serving on the planet's team uh, who are shepherding well, who are stewarding well their resources, the financial resources of Chapel Hill. When I think about them, and also think about the pastor's search committee and how God is, is raising up people, has raised up people from the church uh, to serve in these ways. It's a beautiful thing to see uh, God at work uh, through his people. Hey, I will never uh, think the same about Psalm 122 and verse 1, uh, which says, I mentioned this last week, uh, the verse says, I was glad when they said unto me, I must go to the house of the Lord. I don't think I will ever think it's the same about the first again. Uh, it's good to be with God's people. Well, if you brought the Bible this morning, I love the Bible so that everybody can see it. If you brought the Bible, okay, open it, go ahead and open it to the book of Philippians. We are studying this summer uh, Philippians. We're involved in a sermon series on Philippians, and the title of our sermon series is Joy in the Gospel. Now, not everybody can say that, but we've got to tell people, uh, not only can but want to say that, we are people who find our joy not in the things of this world, not in the circumstances, not in all the things that the world finds of joy. We find our joy in the story. And it's not just a story. It's not just a made-up story. It's a real story. It is the story of God rescuing. It's the story of God sending Jesus from heaven to earth and living a perfect life and dying on the cross for our sins and us being reconciled to God. Uh, that is the gospel. Uh, and our joy is in the gospel. Regardless of what happens to us, the gospel is true. Regardless of what happened yesterday, the gospel is true. Regardless of what happens, we'll have tomorrow, the gospel is true. And we find our joy uh, in the fact that we are right with God because of what God has done for us. So this morning we start in chapter 2. We finished up chapter 1, and this morning we're going to look at the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2. Now, it's not that, it's not that God didn't have to do this, but one of the things that I like to do is I like because this is the Word of God. We don't, we don't worship the Word, but we worship God. But God has given us His Word. He speaks through what He has spoken through. And this is holy, it's right, uh, it's perfect. In fact, it will never end, the Bible says. So because we honor that, because we respect that, we stand, I want us to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. So let's read together Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant. Yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. 
And then he failed in a cumulative form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now, people said, let's be seated. Well, the title of the sermon this morning is The Joy of Gospel Humility. Let's talk this morning from Philippians 2 about humility. Now, wives, this is the part of the sermon where you elbow your husband and tell him to listen up because the preacher's going to talk about humility. If you take this passage of scripture that we have read this morning and you distill it down into four words, it's this, be humble like Jesus. That's what this passage is about. That's what this passage is telling us, be humble like Jesus. That's the simple truth. Now, when I think about any group or any organization, there are threats. There are threats to the identity, and there are threats to the work of that organization. There are threats from without, and there are threats from within. When I think about threats from without, I think about the fact that last Monday was the anniversary of an important day in history, the anniversary of D-Day. When the Allied forces invaded Europe, they went into the, they, when they went into Europe, through the shores of Normandy, it caused the threat of Nazism in the county of Germany. And that outside threat of Nazism was threatening nation upon nation, all of the nations of the world. But when I think specifically about the church, the threats that we have as the church are not threats, I don't think primarily from Without. Now, there are threats, right? We need to be concerned about the outside. We need to be concerned about government intrusion. Uh, we need to be concerned about the confusion and the pressure of abnormal sexuality. We need to be concerned about the threat of religious liberty. But it seems to me that the greatest threats in the church are not those from without. They're those that exist from within. Things like biblical illiteracy, things like heretical theology, things like immoral practices. And maybe the greatest division in the church today, the greatest threat in the church today is division. When the evil one works in a church, he works to create division. And there's so many problems that you see in the life of the church that resulted from the division of that was caused by pride, caused by a lack of humility. Where there is division, there is pride somewhere. You show me a church that is divided, and I'll show you a church where there's pride somewhere. But where there is unity, where there is unity, there are people who are humble people. There are people who, who are walked by humility, who are creating unity. The Bible talks a lot about humility. In fact, the Bible says that God looks at the humble person. The person that is humble is the person that God turns his attention to. God says in Isaiah 66, this is the one to whom I look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Do you want God to notice you? Do you want God to look at you? Well, the scriptures say that God looks on the person who's humble. And then James tells us in James 4 that God opposes the proud and who does he give grace to? He gives grace to the humble. So a humble person is someone not only that God looks to, a humble person is the person who's been, who's been given grace by God. Paul would say that we are to work we are to walk worthy of the Lord in Ephesians, to which we've been called with all humility and gentleness. Humility is a mark of the Christian. The foundational sin that we will struggle 
struggle against is the sin of pride. Of thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. I think about my granddaddy. Whenever someone, my granddaddy has been gone for years now, but my granddaddy, whenever someone was speaking pridefully, or whenever they were, they were con- like they seemed like they were congratulating themselves, my granddaddy, he would say this to, to us boys on the grandkids. If he felt like we were being prideful or we were on a high horse, he would, he would say, don't break your arm and pat yourself on the back. And now I told my kids about how my granddaddy used to say that. So now around our house, if you hear the phrase, don't break your arm, then that means that somebody is being prideful. They're being more prideful. Paul is writing the church to the pride. He's telling them to be humble. Now, if you were to define humility, it's there on your screen. I would say that humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. Being honest about myself. Being honest, honestly assessing who I am. But it's not just in light of anything. It's not in light of you. It's not in light of you. I'm not looking at you myself in light of you. I'm looking at myself in light of two things. In light of God's holiness and my sinfulness. So it's kind of like Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he saw the Lord seated on the throne high and exalted and the seraphim were crying out to another. And they were saying, holy, holy, holy. What did Isaiah say? Isaiah said, whoa. Isaiah realized that in light of God's holiness, he must look at himself realistically. He looked at himself honestly. And Paul is writing to the Philippians, and he's using uh, this great text, this great hymn uh, that the church ought to say, saying, be humble like Christ. That's what Paul is saying in this passage. Be humble like Christ. And that's what I want to say in this sermon. Be humble like Christ. Be humble. He is our example. So let me give you four characteristics of humility. Four things that must characterize our life if we are going to be humble people. First of all, humility seeks unity. Humility loves and seeks unity. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection, simply complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, Paul uses an if then saying, if you have these things, then be like mine. You could translate it since then, since you have these things. Paul's not questioning where you have them, whether you have them, right? He's saying, since you have all of these things, be like minded. If you are encouraged in Christ, if God has given you encouragement, then be unified. If, if you have comfort from the love of Christ, if, if God has shown his love to you and, and you feel comfort in that, then, then be unified. Paul says, if you participate, since you participate in the Spirit, be unified. Since there's affection and sympathy, be Unified, be uh, together. And then look at what Paul says in verse 2. He says, Do all these things. He says, If you have any of these things, or since you have any of these things, then he says in verse 2, Complete my joy by being like minded. Complete my joy. Complete my joy. Now, Paul is out of Rome in prison. They are in Philippi. But what Paul is saying is if you be unified, I will be joyful. Paul is saying your unity brings me joy. Complete my joy by being like mine. If I've heard my mom say it once, I've heard her say it about four million times. She says, I want you and your brother. I've got one brother. You know what she said? I want you all to love. She said, I want you all to get along. No, 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 She said, I want you all to love each other. 
And in reading this passage, I realized that my brother and sister Trey, me and Trey being together makes my mom happy. Us getting along, is there a mom in here that I can get an amen from? Amen. The fact that her kids get along makes mama happy. And if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's what Paul is saying. He said, make my joy complete. Not you all. Because the more you get along, the more unified you are, the happier I will be. You see, unity has its root in humility. If you will be humble, you will seek unity. You see, there are two, two statements that I think are true. And if you're on the stop on the screen here, humility seeks unity, but also humility results in unity. You show me a church where there is unity, and I'll show you a church where there is humility somewhere. Because humility, if you're being humble, and 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 if I'm seeking the interest of somebody else, and rather than myself, all that contributes, and guess what? All of the humble people are unified. You see, unity not only is seek, I mean, humility not only seeks unity, but humility results in unity. Paul would say in Ephesians that we are to be eager to maintain unity. We're going to stomp out division. We don't want division. We want to be unified. Paul would tell the Corinthians, be unified. I don't want there to be any division among you. Now, the only place in Philippians to turn over to John 17. Turn over to John, the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Turn over to John 17. And John 17, that chapter is something called the High Priest of Prayer. So here's the context. Jesus is getting ready, in John 17, Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting ready to die. He's getting ready to, to experience the sins of the world. He knows that he is going to die. And we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is praying. John 17 is some of the most intimate words in the scripture. God talking to God. Jesus praying to God. And as he is getting ready to die, Jesus does not pray primarily for himself or his circumstances. Do you know who Jesus prays for? Us. Here's a man who's about to lose his life. Here's a man who's about to die for the sins of the world. And not only is he praying for us, you know what he's praying for us? He's praying that we would be one. He's praying that we would be unified. That we would be together. Uh, look at verse 20. So remember, Jesus is talking to God. He's praying. He says, I do not ask, starting at verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those of us who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be what? Okay, let's, let's start back at verse 20. Okay, we're going to start back at verse 20. Okay, and then I'm, I'm going to read it up to a point, to a word, and then when I, when I say what, I want you to say what that word is. Okay? So, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be all one. Well, there it is. Okay, one. They may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now look at verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, and they, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know you sent Do you realize Jesus used the word one? He said one four times as he was praying. Jesus wants the church to be unified. The prayer that Jesus prayed to God right before he died, he prayed that the church would be unified. Division is not of God. Unity is of God. And unity comes when we all are practicing humility. Humility seeks unity. But secondly, humility, humility honors others. Humility honors others. Last week we talked about how we are supposed to honor God. There is this vertical aspect to our honor. 
unreal. But you realize that there's also this horizontal aspect. Not only are we, we as people of God honor God, we honor one another. That's what Paul is saying. Now look at verse 3. Uh, go back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, here's that word, in humility can count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition. He doesn't say do some things from selfish ambition, or, or, or do a few things. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition. There must, we cannot in any way be motivated by our own agenda. We cannot be motivated by what we want. We are people who want what others want. I get a front row seat to the two groups, one of our agenda. And you know what I see? I see people <coughs> who are not operating on selfish ambition. I see people who are not trying to work and accomplish and manipulate their ambition. I see people who want what's best not for them, but what's best for the church. And aren't we thankful that there are people like them serving in roles like you see, the Christian is someone who is always focused on what is best for others. The Christian is not someone who is thinking about himself, he's thinking about others. Back before the pandemic, I took my three oldest boys to Nashville and we went to a concert. And uh, you remember that back when people like actually got together and like they split up in different groups? We went to a concert. We were there were a bunch of people here, thousands of people, and, and uh, they had the stage set up, and, and, and uh, the trust, I think is what it's called, with the lights and all that, and uh, we were sitting there, and our focus was on the guy who was sitting. But I noticed that up in the corner of this trust, there was a guy, and he had black shoes on and black pants, and he had a black shirt on, and he had a black hat, and he, he was sitting on the trust. And in between his knees, kind of like a gun, he had a big spotlight. So he's sitting up there, okay? And what he was doing is he was shining the light at this guy who was saying, wherever he went, wherever he got went, he got a good spotlight to him. And then he walked back and he moved the spotlight back over. The whole time we were there, you know what he didn't do? He didn't take the spotlight and turn around and shine on himself. He didn't say, everybody look at me. Everybody in that hall, they paid money not to see him, they paid money to see the guy that was on the stage. And it's almost as if, like we as Christians, it's almost like we have spotlights. And we never turn the spotlight on ourselves. We don't do that. We're always shining the light on others. We always want for others to be in the best light possible. Can I say it effectively? We don't throw shade. Okay? We, we do what's best for others. And what Paul is saying here is don't be in the unselfish ambition of vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Christ is the ultimate example of this. Christ left heaven and he came to this earth for others. Verse 5 of Philippians 2 says, Have this mind in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now look at what it says in verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God in heaven, though he was in the form of God, he did not have the quality of God. And we said this to many of you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But Jesus didn't hang on to that. In fact, he did not account the quality of God a thing to be grasped. Verse 7, he emptied himself by taking on the measure of a servant being born in the likeness of men. 
You see, when Christ came to this earth, Christ was others-centered. Christ, he came to this earth because God told him to come to this earth. He came to this earth not for self. He came to this earth for you and for me. And he died on the cross for you and for me. He did what was not in his interest. He did what was in our interest. He died on the cross. So humility seeks unity, humility honors others, but thirdly, humility seeks to be a servant. Humility seeks to be a servant. A person, uh, a servant is a person who sets aside all personal ambitions, all personal desires, all preferences, their desire for prestige, and they serve others. They live their life and we understand it's not about me. Do you remember the story of James and John, two disciples, in Matthew 20, I believe it is? Yeah, Matthew 20. Their mom went to Jesus. And their mama, has your mom ever done something like this? Their mom went to Jesus and said, Could James and John sit at your right hand? Glory. And the Bible says that the other disciples they were indignant. I can imagine. Here we are, we've been walking with Jesus, and, and if you think that it's all about you sitting at the right hand and the left hand, who are you to be doing that? And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, And then Jesus said, the Son of Man, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for me. Humility seeks to be a servant, like Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Humility seeks to empty himself. That's what Jesus did. It's not about me. He emptied himself. And he became, he took on the form of a servant. And now, when he was on this earth, Jesus was all God and he was all man. But the Bible says, Paul says that he emptied himself of his deity. He did not hold on to the deity. He did not say that that was to be front and center. He became a servant. He did this for us. Because Jesus served us, we realized that we had a responsibility and a privilege. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, and each has received a gift. You realize that every single one of us, we receive a gift. The Bible says that each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Well, let's, just, let's just stop and think about that. Use it. God did not give you a gift so that you would sit on it and soak in it. God gave you and God gave me a gift. And his intention by giving us gifts is that we may do what with it? Use it. Use the gift that God has given you. But Peter says this verse that not only are we to use it, we're to use it to serve one another. I am not responsible for using my gifts to elevate myself. I use my gifts to raise others up. Singing like servant. Finally, I would say this. Because the text says this. Humility seeks God's glory. A humble person is a person who seeks not their own glory and not the glory of another on this planet. They seek the glory of God. Now, put, there's going to be an image on the screen here of what is the ark of Christ. What I say is the ark of Christ. This passage shows us that Christ did a couple things. 
He came down and he went back up. Now that's, that's, that's simple enough to put it. He came down and he went back up. Now, in this graphic, glory or heaven is at the top where Jesus was. Pre eternal, pre existent with God the Father. Always, there's never been a time when Jesus was not. If we think about that too long, we're going to reign for one out of our years. But Jesus has always been, always, with God in heaven. But what it says here in Philippians 2 is that Jesus emptied himself. And he became a servant. He came down to where you and I are. God did not expect that we come up to him. He sent Jesus down to us. So Jesus went from glory to humanity. And he took on flesh. He took on skin. So Jesus was a man just like you. He had hair. He had skin. He probably even had dirt underneath his fingernails. He, he took on humanity. And after he did what God had called him to do, after he lived a perfect life and died on the cross for the sins of the world, after he condescended to her and did this, the Bible says that he ascended back to where he came from. He went back to glory. The Bible teaches, talks about the ascension of Christ. And it also says that right now, Jesus is in glory. And he is at the right hand of the throne of the Father and he's interceding, he's praying for you and for me. And what Paul says in Philippians is this. He says that Christ came down, he took on the flesh of a servant, and now look at verse 9. After he did this, it says in verse 9, therefore God has Highly exalted him. God brought him back up and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. This is what God has done for us. God sent Jesus to come down to this earth. Jesus swooped down and he rescued us. He died on the cross for us. And now he has gone back to heaven. And he is at the right hand of the throne of the Father. And the scriptures teach that when we trust in what Christ has done for us, we will also be with him in glory. Now, we live in a day where not every day bows. And not every tongue confesses that Christ is Lord. Is he Lord? Yes. He's Lord. We believe that. We come to worship today because we believe that Christ is Lord. And while every knee, and every knee does not bow down, every tongue does not confess down, there is coming a time when every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth, whether people are believers or not, they will eventually acknowledge that Christ is Lord. And every time is going to say it. Christ is Lord. Christianity is not about what I do for God. Christianity is about what God has done for me. You see the difference? And because it's not about me, and because Christianity is about what God has done for me, guess what? My response must be you know, I got nothing to be proud of. I can tell you stories. You can tell me stories. But it's not about us. It's about Jesus. And it's about what he has done. And it's about what he has accomplished for us. I'm going to ask you about your hands and close your eyes. Now I'm going to ask you this morning, do you believe
come to Christ. Say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. I thank you for what you have done for me. Lord, I accept what you have done for me. I place all of my faith, all of my trust in you. And Lord, I want to live a life for you the rest of my day, knowing that one day I'll be in face to face. Lord, we are thankful this morning that it's not about us. We're thankful that Christianity is not about what we can do for you. Trust not in ourselves, we trust in you. We look to you. Lord, we don't want to be humble because we think it's sociologically good. We want to be humble because our Lord and Savior has modeled that to us. So, Lord, I pray that as we see you, we hear our.
great. Uh, if any business here did not pick up a, a little cup, on, if, if, if they've ever seen one of our little cups as a gift, we'd love to give that to you uh, on your way out this morning. Uh, just a few announcements we're going to go over on an announcement sheet. Just a reminder that our worship uh, services are the month of June. We've got scheduled for 8.30 and 10.30. We're not meeting at night, but we're going to sit right now in this month. And just watch for our uh, announcements on Facebook, and we'll communicate as well as far as our next phase next month in July and August. Uh, offering, we're not passing the plate. We've got a few baskets back here as you exit. There's a basket you can drop off your ties and offerings and that. Uh, Operation Christmas Child Yard Sale is coming up. The Grace Sunday School class will be having their annual Operation Christmas Child Yard Sale on Friday, July 10th, and Saturday, July 11th, from 7 to 5, both days. It'll be held at the Family Life Center here at the church. And this is an awesome issue that will benefit from your involvement by either helping with the yard sale, setting up or taking down or donating items. Uh, Jim and Huge operational function will be sold. You may drop off donations and pour into the gym behind the curtain. All proceeds will go to our operations Christmas child. And who to sell that is Ms. Barbara Johnson. Her name phone number is on here about communicating. Any more information than that. Uh, we're having virtual PBS this week, so it's a big deal here. Uh, Pick out supplies, PBS supplies, from one to three a day. Uh, and you can still sign up, as Jackie told me earlier. If you haven't signed up for that this week, you can still sign up today for that. And we've got a, a virtual VS prayer guide uh, on your next nice as well. And even for today, pray for those family picking up take home kids. Pray that there's as much excitement as we can hear for this week. And on the back, there's a more announcement about softball. If you're interested in playing a free day softball season, Please contact Brandon McManus and his phone number. Contact information on there. They need to know about tomorrow. So if anyone's interested in playing the uh, please let them know about tomorrow. And they'll try to get the schedule together. So everybody's already standing, so let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much, God, for just a great morning, great day. Father, it's exciting to be able to come back to church, to be inside of the building. Father, we just thank you, God, for being challenged for your word this morning. Uh, how we as Christians should model humility like Christ modeled for us. Father, may we apply all that we have told this morning to our lives. Lord, we love you and we pray in Jesus' name.